haven't tried it. <laughs> it's like drinking. It's like drinking pancakes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I actually had it pancakes is. at dinner tonight. What you, you can't beat the that. Fat, I mean, that's, the fat that's man Canadian. in me drinking pancakes. <laughs> The fat man in me is like, I want to drink pancakes. I, mean, I was like, that, that I, doesn't I sound feel bad like, in theory. Yeah, I was like, I feel like Sounds I should be into that. But. <laughs> no, when I was an undergrad, there was this place near my campus that had a breakfast shot, and I don't know what was in it, a lot of alcohol, but it tasted like pancakes <laughs> and and maple syrup. It was very strange. I, I'm you guessing have more than probably one, some maple whiskey in there. <laughs> I think, yeah, and some orange juice was in there, too, somehow. Um, it tasted like breakfast, but if you had more than one, you were in for a rough night. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. It tastes like breakfast. <laughs> it did. I feel like that needs to be their ad campaign. It tastes like breakfast. Right. <laughs> I think oh. we broke Joe. Oh, my God. Okay, it's happening. <laughs> Joe is talking to the chat right now while we just go on about <laughs> the random alcohol. I was I'm actually laughing off screen oh. while I was setting all this stuff up in the background because you guys, I you guys crack me up so much. Oh my god, it's been... <laughs> I'm more concerned why this beer, one of its um, notes, is fluffy. <laughs> That's an interesting. Will this, um... will this come through if I put it up to the screen? Nope. Nope. You have, no, you have to do. Like, you have a, to do. That's... So you got to do it like the beauty YouTubers and put your hand the behind. Hand. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh. oh. she's got it. Yep. The, the last thing I am is a beauty YouTuber. <laughs> but what what description? Uh, unfortunately, that's my disaster. background. Hmm. Our, our chat here, PH, PH disaster. I missed the description of the shot. Which one are we talking about here? Oh, the breakfast shot. Oh, fluffy oh, and tropical yeah, maple, mist. Yeah, maple. Uh, I don't know. It tasted like breakfast. Um, it's like breakfast. Talking about how like I maple describe whiskey. whipped cream, though. Yeah. I don't describe it as a taste. Right. I, well, uh, I mean, you right. heard that descriptor a lot on like the Great British Bake Off. Fluffy. Yeah. I'm not the only one that watches that. They, well, I mean, do, thank you so much. I mean, with that though, do they do the judges ever go? I, I, I'm getting nodes and whiffs of fluffy, fluffy. <laughs> See, unfortunately, I, I think of Gabriel Iglesias because thank the fluffy you. Bit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, like, are, are you taking whiffs of Gabriel Point. Iglesias? <laughs> And again, I live in Los Angeles, so I know the smell of overweight. Uh, yeah, because you can smell it. Because you can smell it. Oh man! <laughs> oh, what did we do? What did we do? Well, we have eight people on a podcast. This is what happens. Indeed. All right, oh. chaos, then. this is this is usually how most academic conversations get started as it is. So, yeah, uh, but that's alcohol true as well. or yeah, <laughs> perfect. We're on par. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, if you want to talk about academic that. conversations, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I don't know. I don't know what those are. What are academic conversations? They usually Scra start scrounging for food at yeah. uh, university banqu banquets. <laughs> Real, yeah. You see all the undergrads going, oh, let's all be professional and see the graduate students. Give me, give me, <laughs> I'm broke, you know. give me. If, if you see people in a banquet and they're like, look young, but are dressed professionally, they're undergrads. Um, yeah. If they're dressed in like raggedy sweatpants and are eating all the food, <laughs> grad students. Grad students. <laughs> <laughs> the stereotype is real. <laughs> Yep. It's, like, it's funny wow. because it's true. Yeah, we've yeah. been in grad school. We know. Yeah. <sighs> Check their pockets on the way out. I guarantee they got food in there. There's like four bagels and a muffin. <laughs> I watched him take a pig in a blanket. Yeah, I was say, I need breakfast for tomorrow, too. Oh, my God. <sighs> All right. Well, if nobody's got any questions on uh, the show notes or anything, they're pretty basic, but uh, JL, if you want to lead us in for the intro, and Matt, I pinned the um, information for Bugs. the closer at the end. Do you want to cover that at the end? Sure, I'll sell my soul out. <laughs> you do that, Matt. I wouldn't word So you want to still, still do the... Uh... <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> We're so broken tonight. <laughs> you just don't want us to do the, the clap, Joe, for the the marker, or are you you good? <gasps> Can we do eight claps? Eight claps, please. Oh, no, <laughs> Jeremy, yeah, I am a UCLA usually, fan. 
what we usually do uh, generally is we clap because uh, when I do post editing, uh, the clap puts a giant spike on the audio wave, and I can pick it there where we actually started. But I usually start the recording a little earlier, so maybe I can pick up like some funny intro. And uh, well, there was many of those. So <laughs> there, there, there are many. <laughs> All right, composure. The information presented on this podcast is of a general nature and is intended for educational and entertainment purposes. While many of the people here have some form of mental health training, they are not your mental health professional. This podcast is not a replacement for mental or physical care or for the diagnosis of any mental health illness or condition. So, hello, and thank you for joining us once again for the Guardians MH Podcasts. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Goku, and with me tonight is my good friend, Joe. Hi. Did we Nate. Just become best friends? Howdy. Yep. Alan. Yo. And Matt. Hello there. If you're joining us for the first time, Guardians MH is a 501c3 nonprofit, which is focusing on promoting mental health awareness throughout the gaming community and being a first step in assisting individuals with gathering meaningful resources in a safe and inclusive atmosphere. Our podcast is just another way to normalize talking about mental health and is a fusion between mental health topics and gaming. So tonight, I want everyone to welcome our three guests, so the, the most we've had on any podcast, Dr. Orm, Dr. Daniel, and Dr. Fersho. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yes, thank hey, you so much. You've been a lot of fun so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm back in school. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little scared. I'm a little intimidated here. <laughs> so for the people that may not know or that are joining us for the first time, um, Dr. Daniel, Dr. Orm, and Dr. Farshaw were the research team that were part of the Streamer Mental Health Kit that we were part of building. And they did a, a big section on parasocial relationships. And as soon as I heard that, my ears perked up because, like I had already mentioned, I have a 100-page thesis <laughs> sitting behind me somewhere on the exact topic. So they had my attention. <laughs> Don't let him fool you. He knows exactly where it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's somewhere in the boxes and the stuff in my storage room. <laughs> and in two languages. True. Yeah, well, it was, written, it was written in French and a rough <laughs> Google translation in English. <laughs> Yes, I, I do have to say, just touching on the uh, Streamer Mental Health Kit uh, program, I, I took that and I, I told you earlier, uh, that section uh, of that course, talking about the parasocial relationships and the research that you all did together collaboratively was amazing. Uh, you had my attention from the get-go as a, you know a layman and just an average Joe. Uh, it was so informative and so well put together and it was so comfortable. The conversation that you had with it and delivering the information was so organic and just comfortable. I absorbed it so well. And when I was done taking the course, I think I went into the discord server and even told Tony and everybody like, I just finished. That was my favorite part. And then I told John Luke too, uh, when I finished it and he was like, I, I have to take this now. I know I have to, <laughs> I have to see what you mean. And you know what? It, you did a fantastic job. And really, it's it's really an honor having all three of you on to chat with us tonight. Thank you. That's incredibly sweet. Uh, and we're I think we're all glad that that's been so well received. Yeah. And I mean, it, that's one of the goals that the three of us have talked about a lot is trying to get our research out beyond just academic journals, which are, you know, great. They're peer reviewed. They're, you know, rigorous science, but they don't do a whole lot of good if that's where they end, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's really something that we wanted to do. So we were so we were so happy to have the opportunity to do that and to be on the podcast with you guys. Thank you. I gotta say, I'm glad it sounded fluid because um, I arranged the PowerPoint and it, all it was was, okay, Steph, you speak here. Ariane, you speak here. <laughs> I speak here. So if it sounded <laughs> fluid. I have no credit into that. No. <laughs> you all did a really good job. Thank you. Oh, people was, that thank you. may not know who you are, why don't you tell our, our, our viewers and listeners who you are? Who wants to go first? I'll go. All right. Uh, I'm Steph Worm. Um, I'm a professor of communication and media studies. I teach at Emanuel College in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and my primary area of research is actually in the video game industry and gaming culture. 
Um, I do a lot of work from sort of a, a feminist lens, so I'm really interested in understanding how identity intersects with game design and also how players experience video games and also what it means to be part of whatever we call gaming culture and all the nuances that go into that. Um, and also increasingly some esports and, and streaming research with that as well. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Ariane, Who wants you to go, go next? next? Sure, I'll go. Um, my name is Ariane Fascio. Um, first of all, I'm so happy that you pronounced my name correctly. That just warms my heart. <laughs> Never happens. Um, but um, I am an assistant professor at Florida State University down in Tallahassee. So while you guys are all in the snow, I am not. Um, <laughs> Must so, be nice. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm I'm being requested in in the, the chat group. also to talk about the meme group, which That's is right. my research group at Florida State University. Is the multimodal Ooh. emerging media entertainment research group. So my research focus, as well as the focus of that group, is all about new and emerging media technologies as they relate to entertainment. Um, so a large part of that is video games. I've been doing a lot of video game work recently, but also other forms like social media um, and binge watching, things like that. And and more recently too, I've been trying to get a little bit more into specifically mental health um, and, and thinking about ways to reduce mental illness stigma through interactive media like video games. So, um, it's something I'm really, really interested in, so I'm always happy to talk about it. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Emery Daniel. Uh, I am an assistant professor at Appalachian State University, which is in the mountains of North Carolina. But we do have snow, uh, about eight inches last night. Um, so we're pretty much, anything that goes on in North Carolina, we're still significantly different. Um, in that capacity. Um, I actually teach advertising courses here at App State. Thank you so much, um, But my so primary good. research focus was around uh, actually months. bringing awesome. parasocial relationships and what we call mass personal communication of feeling like it's interpersonal 1v1 communication, but actually speaking to a grander audience. So I, I do a lot of work with influencers. I do a lot of work with streamers. Um, that's kind of how I got into gaming, and now it is taking a life of its own. Well, thank you all for, for joining tonight. It, having this diversity of professional background, and, and certainly within the, the streamer kit, was such an addition. Uh, how did all of you kind of get interested in parasocial relationships? Because I know I have my my own story of how I got interested into the into the topic. Um, I, I guess I can start with this. Um, oh, so parasocial second. relationships are actually some of the first things I ever worked on in a research capacity. Um, when I was at LSU, I worked with a woman by the name of Dr. Megan Sanders, um, who does a lot of work at all right, give me a second. And that's fix. kind of where I started to learn about that. Um, Emory and I actually met after an 8 a.m. parasocial relationships panel at NCA, which is our um, National Communication Association, one of our major conferences. Um, we we had this whole panel on parasocial relationships that we went to breakfast. Um, and then we kind of kept in touch. Steph and I knew each other from grad school. Um, and I think it was just kind of a natural thing that we fell into based on that interest because um, it's just one of those things, right? Like people are like, oh, you're so weird. You have like this relationship with this like media character. And I'm like, you better stop because so do you. Everybody does, right? Yeah, everyone does. <laughs> everyone does. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's that's what I would say there. Yeah, I wrote a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Not to not to kind of interrupt this flow, but I guess just for everybody listening and watching right now, could we kind of explain what the, the meaning behind a parasocial relationship is? That'd be great. Who sure. wants to do it? <laughs> no pressure. This is the this is the topic that we're dealing with. Um, I, I I can go. Um, so parasocial uh, relationships and interaction is a term that was coined in 1956. Uh, by scholars Horton and Wool, 
Uh, in fact, if you have any parasocial paper, it always begins with Harton and Wall. Um, basically, the concept was um, a, surrounded by this idea of having these real emotions uh, and feeling like there's an interaction between myself as a viewer and a media figure. So when this first started out, this was talking about newscasters. Um, so again, it was kind of a big thing in the 50s and 60s of, again, not only feeling like there's an interaction between uh, the mediated character and uh, the, the viewer, but also we look into um, kind of what happened afterwards. It kind of died down for uh, a, a big period of time until social media came into play. Uh, and now it's made a huge revival um, to the point where scholars are having a lot of conversations about what is parasocial, what is social, because uh, the idea behind it, it is a one way relationship. It is a one way interaction. So um, while the viewer may feel like something, um, feel like a significant relationship, uh, I myself as the person who is now on screen doesn't know this person at all that's viewing me. Yeah, it, it, back in in the in 1956 when uh, Horton Hall dis really studied it, uh, it was that new age of the newscaster on the TV, where it was that synonymous figure day in and day out that you knew at 6 p.m. this person would be on the news. Uh, you would build this relationship because we weren't inundated with Twitter and Facebook and everything by then, you would get the news either through the paper or on TV. And people started to build this relationship. I remember um, when I was really, really young, my grandmother talking to me about uh, the old host of The Price is Right. She would watch The Price is Right every, uh, every time around noon, kind of became my thing of every kid when they were uh, off of school sick you watch the prices right while eating lunch so true <laughs> literally my childhood yeah right oh my god that's i think you nailed most of us right there <laughs> whenever i was sick wait a hit the field more soap operas yeah <laughs> soap operas is, oh soap operas are great though for it I what's mean, scary is if i was oh. sick from school it'd be charmed in the morning on TBS, and then it would go to. Don't ask, and that, that everybody's gonna make fun of me because I watch Charmed. Um, <laughs> I oh, love Charmed. Oh, Thank oh, you. Charmed. Yeah. It's such a good show. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but then no, then I would dive right into uh, Price is Right at twelve o'clock. Yeah, man. God, the flood of memories that just came into my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there's something to be said for that because parasocial is linked with nostalgia. Yeah, and and off oftentimes so. Um, you know, these considerations that we bring into these media figures of feeling these great emotions with, uh, yeah, it has a lot of link, to, with, link with nostalgia. I can't help but think, too, also in the game show realm, like Alex Trebek, right? Again, mm. most of oh. them, we haven't, we never met that guy, right? But yeah, like you hear his name. He's a Canadian and, icon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he, his, his passing like really affected a lot of people. And I think today, didn't they just air his like final episode? Is that, I was seeing something about that. Yeah. And so people again were like, responding with this emotional outpouring to again a guy who they've never met in person but nonetheless mm -hmm. had this to them very real attachment because humans build these connections even though physically there we have learned over time because we are these social creatures and going to the, the psychological aspect of it we are these social creatures that many of the things that we have learned we have one never experienced or the things that we have learned about have never seen someone has told us about it or we've seen a video or a movie or something about it so we build yeah. these memories these understandings it's, it's yeah really, oh go ahead Ariane. I, I was just going to add, you know, in 2020, we saw actually a lot of this because we lost a lot of people, a lot of celebrities, right? Um, we lost Kobe Bryant early in the year. Um, later on, we watched, we lost Chad with Bozeman. Yep. Um, and, and, and these are all situations when we've had these relationships that have just been severed, right? Um, abruptly in those two cases, right? Thank you because so much for the, the that wandering you, you know, You're Kobe awesome. Bryant died in an Thank accident, so Chad with Bozeman, nobody knew he was sick. Um, 
whereas you know someone like Alex Trebek, we did know that he was ill, uh, but it was still you know the dissolution of this relationship, and and it's a little bit of lizard brain, right? So um, our brains don't really know the difference between this one-sided media relationship and um, a real quote unquote social relationship. Um, which build, is why you just build the same feelings. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That was um, actually one of the things that when when I got started into doing parasocial, I actually wrote a uh, with a uh, my dissertation chair a study about Game of Thrones and the death of a certain character. Um, I, I try not to. Just... <laughs> the name of the character is in the name of the paper. It's in the abstract. I actually got someone fussed at me because of it. They're like, ah, spoilers. So, and I also made somebody in my office cry because they didn't know. So there's that. Whoops. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was, it was Jon Snow. And it's actually kind of a funny oh, story of how this got started. Ah. <laughs> uh, you're too late at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it, it was really interesting though, because this was like right when um, uh, we were about to write this paper and say, how are we going to analyze uh, responses to a death of a Game of Thrones character uh, in real time? So we went on Twitter, we were about to scour uh, them and base them off the Kubler-Ross stages of grief mm. to see if there's mm -hmm. any similarity. Well, <laughs> Shireen had died and I was like, well, this may be a, a, a good one to, to look at. And so I was kind of scouring Twitter and then Jon Snow died. And I told my, my chair, I'm like, stop whatever you're doing. We need to go here now. Um, but what we found was the the model of Kubo Ross, which is oh boy, denial, anger, bargaining, um, depression, and acceptance. Okay, good, still nailed it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, within those, they they don't necessarily go into the pattern that it's the dabda that everybody thinks it does, um, and they can repeat. However, it followed a very similar trend to what it would be normally like uh, if a real person had died. Um, so it's not just, uh, you know, people who are celebrities, it's fictional characters, too. I think the, the reason I got started into Parasocial was a paper written by John Co Cohen, and I think it was in 2009, about uh, the series ending of Harry Potter uh, and looking oh. at parasocial breakups mm -hmm. and, you know, looking at these coping strategies of, you know, do I stop with the series entirely or do I write fan fiction or, you know, do I pick up on something new? Hunger Games was coming out right when uh, Harry Potter movies just stopped. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of really uh, cool things in terms of one, the ubiquity of parasocial because it's all around us. But the other thing is that they just feel so real. Mm -hmm. um, the, these deaths cause so much pain uh, for us. It's also akin to very good writing, but these deaths have a buildup. You have this, just like I said, a buildup where I you get to life. know so much these the characters intimately. Very much different than you have in a, a, a quote unquote real relationship because you are kind of in their head, you are privy to some of their thoughts. So you get closer to a character and a lot of these characters can embody certain characteristics that we hold dear, that we either empathize with or that we really connect. And uh, there was a really good uh, study, um, what was this, back in 2015 by a group of Italians where they saw that the people that had really high ties or within Harry Potter characters were much less likely to be prejudicial compared to students, well, uh, students that were uh, more linked to kind of the, the Slytherins or the, the Voldemorts or the Draco Malfoys. Yeah, and this actually ties into a concept um, that is it, based on the contact hypothesis, which is that if you don't have if you've got prejudicial attitudes towards some out group, mere contact, so coming into contact with them is enough to help overcome that. And so some guys um, coined what we call the parasocial contact hypothesis, which is the same thing, but with media um, mm. characters. 
um, and so they've shown it a lot, particularly with like LGBTQ groups. Mm -hmm. um, and and so there's some evidence of it. It's, it's still a little bit understudied, I think, but um, it, it's kind of similar to what you're talking about there. Yeah. But any contact is better than no contact at all. Exactly right. And so the idea is that if you don't have contact, then parasocial contact is good enough, mm. or at least better than nothing. Mm. Uh, because it actually doesn't tend to work that well if you've also got contact. The parasocial contact doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to in what we wanted to talk about tonight with, with streamers and characters, for streamers, a lot of the time, certainly for the, the bigger streamers, they can have... 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 or more people at once in chat, they can't interact or have these relationships with everyone that they have in chat. This but for the viewer, they have that parasocial relationship, that unidirectional relationship with that streamer. It, it was really interesting for the people that we talked to because it ranged from people who weren't even affiliate to people who were partnered. Um, and the jargon was different. Um, people who were much larger streamers were much more comfortable with calling their community fans, mm. Um, mm. which are, excuse me, in, if you were a smaller streamer, uh, it was almost considered uh, faux pas to call them fans. They're like, no, 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 this is my community. Um, and, yeah. and they treat them as such. But, mm. you know, it, one thing that really got to me because I, I I've definitely gotten into a few arguments with some people of is this actually parasocial relationships because it's supposed to be this one way communication. I've got the chat open right now for Twitch and I'm reading the comments throughout. So in in a lot of ways, I can look at the person that wrote a comment. I can say who that person is and I can answer said question. Um, so that's what we would call social interaction. Mm -hmm. But the, the interesting thing was, and it was like way beyond me, but when we got started on this, um, on this research pr project was people were saying, well, people watch on their PlayStation and they don't even interact, but they still come up to me at a conference like, oh my gosh, I'm your best friend. And that just floored me. I mean, I, mean, I, <laughs> I, I almost like dropped my recording device because I was like, I never would have thought of that. I mean, I should have, but um, but it's a lot of but, people have the streams on in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's akin to that TV newscaster that even though you're not actively watching, it's it's there. It's yeah. that presence. Right, and I'm you're picking up all this. You're picking up all this information. So someone walks up to you, and they can they can tell you about about your wife and your kids, and you're going, I, I know nothing about you, right. but because you're the sole focus. You, you do, you get people, fans or community members, however we want to identify them, that they enjoy that in a sense. They enjoy being able to be present within the chat and learn as much about someone as as possible. And I don't mean this in like a creepy stalkerish way, but it does. It provides that interaction that somebody might desperately need for, you know, COVID quarantine reasons or just in general. Sure. And the, the yeah. research on, on streaming as a whole supports a lot of that, right? Like one of the primary motivations for people tuning into streams is social fulfillment, right? But they, like a lot of studies have, have been finding that it's a lot of these people interesting if social fulfillment for them doesn't mean engaging in the chat, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a project that I was just recently wrapping up, um, it was about people who, who religiously watch streams. And uh, most of them talked about never engaging in the chat but they still described it as, as a social gratification that they were receiving from this. And I was like, well, that's interesting, right? How do we define social when there's no kind of two-way interaction? And they were definitely touching on a lot of these parasocial themes. So, you know, I think, again, it's, it's in a lot of ways, I think more than people realize, um, streaming can be similar to a lot of the traditional media, like the, the talk show hosts that we were talking about in the 50s and 60s. And I think um, something Something to keep in mind too when we're thinking about parasocial relationship is that nearly all of the research on parasocial relationships is from the perspective of the viewer. Um, so it is one sided on the part of the viewer um, where they are interpreting interactions as being two sided and they are not. Um, 
almost no research looks at the the media persona, which is what we're trying to do. So that's exciting. Um, mm-hmm. But it, there's arguments. Yeah, people definitely have argument like, okay, well, if the streamer is actually able to look in the chat and say, you, X, Y, Z, yay, blah, 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 is still a massive imbalance, right, in the mm-hmm. amount of information that is being shared. Um, it is, it's, it's men- it's a mention. It's not a meaningful interaction, right? Mm-hmm. It's um, not a real connection. Right. So it's akin to saying hello to a passerby on the street. Exactly. Rather than sitting down and actually having a coffee. Yeah, Remember that's when a good analogy. Well, <laughs> I, and and that got brought up a lot. Yeah. Was uh, the streamers? I think like three or four times during the interviews would say, "Who am I going to go get a beer with after the panel?" And, and they were very adamant about they've got like their crew that they go along with, which very funny true. enough in, included their mods. And they were like, my mod is, uh, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm like going on a quick tangent. Uh, the, the, I can't, if it's a game called Gamer Girl or something, uh, where it brought in this mod who had no idea. I know who you're talking this about. Person yeah. was. And I was like, in no way is that re- reality because mods are like the most trusted people within streamers and we we saw it like when people came to our interviews mods Easy would cat. come Thank with so much for the uh, and, and converse with i mean it's not that, that they were bodyguards but i i almost kind of uh say it's like akin to uh, watching devils wear prada where Meryl Streep's <laughs> looking over and say, who is that person? And the, the mod's like, oh, this is so-and-so. You know them from, oh, right, yeah, nice to see you. <laughs> I love that movie. We, I own we that movie. Did. <laughs> it's so good. We did find, Emery, that a lot of times, like, the streamers said they brought their mods along because they were like, my mod can honestly answer questions about my channel better than I can, right? And I, I they're the one having the interactions. Exactly, yeah. right? And so that's something, too, that I think one of the interesting things with you know, if we wanted to talk about how streaming is still parasocial is you may think you're having as a viewer, all these interactions with the streamer, but you might be talking to mods. You might be talking, you know, to someone who you don't think it's, it's that person. Right. And one thing as well with, with the streamer, not saying that this is all for all streamers, but a lot of them, this is a persona or an Mm -hmm. exaggeration of who they are on stream rather than Dr. Disrespects and, yeah, not Doctor Disrespect in real life. <laughs> he has a right. wife and kids, and he used so, to work in the gaming industry. Yeah, so, Steph and I actually have a piece um, about uh, related to this topic about what people do in. We, we it was about YouTube, but a, a lot of the same logic holds. Um, so that this perception of authenticity is really important, mm-hmm. and people want to be like, yes, this is the real person. At the same time. It's rarely a good idea to just be 100% this is my life because then you might have things like people overstepping their bounds, showing up mm. at your house. Um, mm. And, and ADHD, you know, Apple. just the person so I am on a, in a camera, I'm, if I'm in my house, I'm not talking, you know, I have a cat, that's it. This is me, right? So I don't like go around talking to her and like telling her stories and, you know, I, I'm kind of a, more of a reserved person whereas if we go by by the example of teaching for example i'm much more animated um Mm -hmm. because that's what the audience expects right Mm -hmm. right because for me when i have clients in my office for therapy i try to be as me as i can but i still behave through a therapist's lens Mm -hmm. so I, I, i try i try to have that very fine line between being very authentic, but also being the therapist. Yeah, this goes to the, um, gosh, is it Gerbner? No, oh man, I'm gonna, I can't remember the name of the- Yeah, Gerbner. The, st- the backstage- what, Cultivation? Oh. oh no, 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 not that. Goffman. Goffman, thank you, Goffman. Goffman, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, the front stage backstage behavior, right, mm-hmm. where um, ultimately it is a sort of a performance. Just become best um, mm-hmm. yep. And we have different behavior for different audiences. When I'm talking with my friends, I'm not the same person as when I'm talking to my students, as Hello. when I'm talking to my mom, Thank you so much for as when I'm talking to my cat. You know, it's all mm-hmm. different. Um, and I think because we have this perception of authenticity, um, sometimes as viewers, we kind of get it twisted a little bit. Like, oh, I know this person. They're my best friend. I've seen all of their backstage behavior, but you right. haven't. No, you, you've seen the persona, 
that is there. And right, I that, think, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, sorry, but the, the, the whole on stage, backstage, working in a hospital, we called it on stage, off stage, right? So as right. soon as you left the break room, that's it. You're on stage. You need to act like a professional. Once you get into the break room, okay, cool. All the, all the, you know, the guards can come down. But it's also very similar too, right? Because I wouldn't speak as far as on a ther- in a therapy sense, I'm not going to talk to a 12 year old the same way that I would talk to a 35 year old. You know, so my language and and the way that I act, I probably would be more animated with a 12 year old laughing and getting on their level a little bit more. Whereas a 35 year old is not going to want me to be like high pitched and animated and happy. They, they, right. They're going to want me just to, you know, listen to them. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so the difference is there, which I, I guess brings me to a question like when it comes to a therapist like and the therapist persona in my like the way that i'm understanding it at least parasocial relationships touch on that very much it it sounds like Hmm. it's not necessarily it's because it's but it's not a one way so that i that Hmm. i do understand but there are features there that seem to Hmm. tie into a therapist Uh, because it'll depend on the therapist some therapists share nothing at all and Hmm. some can be a little bit more open but again you're seeing the person through this veil of the therapist yeah and i I, you're reminding me of mr robot i don't know if you guys have seen mr robot um not yet but it's on my to watch list to be honest well there's um i'm not gonna try to spoil too much about it but there's um a therapist character krista who um i want to i'm trying to put therapy as a verb and that's not right like uh she Counsel, what's the word? Like she counsels. Her, counsels I was yes. gonna, I was gonna she say therapizes, therapizes too. <laughs> therapizes uh, the main character. Yeah. Uh, so the main character, Rami Malik's character, um, Elliot, um, and she's very professional. You know, she's in her you know, front stage or or on stage um, behavior, but he breaches that by hacking her and like finding out everything about her, and that is a serious violation of that sort of one way thing mm-hmm. and, and you know she's very upset when she finds out about that um and you know I, steph emory and i we're not therapists but we are professors and i think in some ways we have some similarities um when we're talking to students for example um yeah it, it, it's not you know they're they know me as dr fascio right i'm not mm-hmm. arian i'm not your buddy i'm not your, your drinking pal right um and 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 it's a different persona and they might have it's almost like a semi parasocial thing as you're saying mm-hmm. uh, they're having social interactions with us but they're not having know, social interactions with you right. right and i have i have a lot of students um especially if i'm teaching a large class which at florida state i can teach sometimes over 200 students at once um i i don't I, it's almost completely parasocial in that sense i don't know the individual students unless they really go out of their way to make themselves known, right? Um, and so- You're in a Twitch it, chat, basically. It's, yeah. Essentially, it yeah. Is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, being, yeah. A ma- being a mass lecturer, that, that comes up quite a bit. Um, and, and to that point, and Ariane, I think, I think he makes uh, a really good observation, especially with, um, I, I, I kind of like to look into this line of social interaction, but parasocial relationships. Um, and this isn't really something that's been talked about too much because the, the measures of parasocial relationships, when people measure, it's just so parasocial interaction plus more. Like it's like an N plus one phenomenon. It's just more of them. Um, but right. the, you know, it's really opened my, I think all of our eyes when it came to streaming was, you know, the streamers we were talking to were like, yeah, I'm not having the same thing. Even if I talk to this person, I'm not friends. I'm friendly with them, but I, I, there, there is a very strong categorization issue here, um, which is, you know, I, I always made jokes about it at conferences, but I said, you know, what, what is a high school crush other than, you right. know, an, an identity projection off of somebody? I mean, it's like attaching an identification onto somebody. Um, to where I can talk with them, but, you know, I, I mean, I did it when I was younger of saying, you know, this person, this is who I thought that they were. And then when I got to know them, I'm like, boy, my basis was way off. Mm-hmm. Right. Because so, people show 
in those type of contexts, you tend to believe things. You have that this projection as to who they might be by, um, by kind of the small little elements or hints that you may have. Sure. And now even more so with social media, you get this abundance of information that you build this hypothesis of a person that you can become kind of completely wrong about. No. You can breach these barriers so much quickly, so much more quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Steph. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with that. Like, I think that the wealth of information you now have about any person who is in some kind of public eye is, it's incomparable, right, to what it, it mm -hmm. used to be with, with talk show hosts and things like that. And again, it's like, you may never meet that person, but, you know, you also couldn't tweet at them, right? Like, I think social media has forever changed mm -hmm. the relationship mm -hmm. with parasocial relationships, yeah. right? So you couldn't tweet at them and get a response back. Right, exactly, right. Yeah. And, and, and even if you yeah. think about the way that people react to tweets, right? Like, let's say, you know, I tweet at one of my favorite authors or something and they like one of my tweets, like you feel this, this dopamine rush, right? Yeah, like, you get yeah. so oh giddy, my God. Like, <laughs> right, Neil, Neil Gaiman liked my tweet, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, <laughs> and it's like, what? Did that, <laughs> did that really happen to you? Did Neil Gaiman No, like girl, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I love but, the graveyard book. <laughs> Oh, so good. But it looks what I mean is like it it actually does like even it, you know, even to those of us who, who feel like we know we understand, you know, that's not a real We're not immune to it. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, no, exactly. Right. It, it's just like a natural response you have to those people that you, you really adore. Right. And, and mm -hmm. look up to. Now, what part because uh, I'm, I'm kind of trying to think about a, a little bit of what everybody's been going through this last year. And do you does isolation and like loneliness play a part into parasocial relationships, especially with like the now with how, how big live streaming and uh, social media and everything people have had time at home. And it seems to be one of the main forms of in social interaction. Do you mm -hmm. think there's been a, an increase in parasocial relationships over the course of the Most last definitely. year versus over the past Several I'm years? inclined to say probably um, there is some older, uh, rel not old, old. It's not like from 1950s, but around the 80s. I'd say Ruben and Purse, um, who are also, huh? Careful I was just calling saying, 80s old. Same. Well, not old in terms of research. It's not as recent as like social media that we've been talking about. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I think Dave um, was in his 20s in the 80s. <laughs> um, but they there are some studies out there that that kind of correlate loneliness with parasocial relationship formation, but then there's other studies that are like, you know, it's not just lonely people that do it. Right. Um, but media can fulfill some of the social functions um, that we would expect without being social. So uh, one thing that uh, parasocial relationship can do is, is that it helps negate or act like as a buffer for social rejections. So there was a good study mm -hmm. in 2009 by Derek, Gabriel, and uh, I'm going to butcher the name, uh, Hugenberg, <laughs> where they really looked at how um, certain personal relationships are uh, and these interactions can play this buffer role when people get rejected socially. So humans are these social creatures. We need these social interactions. Come COVID, we do not have these social interactions anymore or, or, or lack thereof. So falling into these parasocial relationships helps kind of protect us from this type of rejection that we may feel. I also think there's a couple things, um, and, and, and I do think these are excellent points. Um, th there was research that kind of said it's a complement to social interaction. It wasn't necessarily, because th this was the misconception is that they would say, People who are lonely dive into parasocial. Well, that wasn't necessarily true. I know that <laughs> has already been talked about, but it is a compliment too. Like <laughs> pe people who are social butterflies also have a lot of parasocial relationships. <laughs> Everyone um, can have a parasocial relationship. Yeah, and if, I think everybody does, it would be my <laughs> theory. Um, but I, I also think there's something to be said, um, and this really does um, work with the pandemic, is where 
um, parasocial relationship stems from is kind of the umbrella of telepresence because um, that's kind of where it all came from and more specifically social presence. And with social presence, it's that illusion of technology that I actually feel like I'm having a conversation. And what better way to talk about a Zoom call of, do I feel so engrossed that I feel like there is an illusion of technology that I feel like y'all are actually here. Um, that really does need to be discussed with the idea of parasocial versus social interaction though, um, even with COVID because you know I, I will make sure that I reach out to a friend of mine and either call or go, you know, get on a Zoom call or whatever. Um, but then I also have those opportunities where I watch a streamer. You know, I before this I was watching GDQ um, and game, games done quick, and uh, I've got a couple of influencers who I, who I really like. Um, who, yeah, I'm not pretending that we're friends or anything. Hmm? Um, you know, <laughs> we do the research. Oh, I, I'm, I'm even self-aware. Even something is as some, some, something as simple when we started this call. You know, you know, we we all poured a glass of scotch, and you guys felt the social contract there to go pour yourself pour yourself your own. Mm-hmm. Right? We're not all sitting in a bar together, but remember here we, are. we could all do that. <laughs> yeah. But I, I will there's that replication. Also... I will also suggest too that there is a distinction between a mediated a mediated interaction and a parasocial interaction, mm-hmm. um, which is that we what we're doing right now is social, mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. on the call. Yeah, because uh, we're, we're talking, talking each other. Um, we're interacting. Yes, whereas on the stream on chat, you know, we might recognize a few names. We might you know be able to recognize people who maybe come to streams often. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, we're not having this sort of meaningful connection with them at this moment, at least. Um, and so I, I think that's one thing to be pretty clear about. It's all, I also, I'm going to throw a plug in here. Plug. Um, I'm actually <laughs> co-editing a special issue of Psychology of Popular Media, where we're talking about um, uh, basically entertainment media in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I, there are some, they're going to, you know, hopeful, we're, we're in the reviewing stage of that. <laughs> Now, but I'm hoping that there will be um, some papers about this exact topic. So mm-hmm. uh, keep an eye out. It'll be a, a few months yet, but um, given your other the, editor, I'd hope so. Because <laughs> there, <laughs> there are studies that show how these parasocial relationships not only do they have these these buffer effects, but it helps to reduce the deteriorations of certain aspects of ourselves. Sure. Certainly now within the pandemic, nowhere near that I thought when I was writing my thesis that this would hold so true, where it helps uh, kind of reduce the deterioration of cognitive tasks. It helps uh, have a positive effect on your self-esteem. It helps raise your mood. So having these parasocial relationships helps to mitigate these things by linking yourself to a character, getting engrossed in this story, feeling like you're connecting. So not to be the uh, Debbie Downer of, of, of the group here right now, but here's my question, because as this whole conversation is going on, my head is going to, not that it's the same thing, but I'm kind of correlating between healthy attachments and unhealthy attachment when we, if, if, we're, if we bring it to attachment theory. Is there such a thing as a healthy and an unhealthy parasocial relationship? And I guess I, I ask that because as, as a social worker who meets with clients, what am, should I be looking out for like particular signs of what might be considered an unhealthy sort of para uh, relationship? Matthew, I don't ever want you to feel down about being the Debbie Downer because uh, I wrote three publications in a row that were all about death. I was the Debbie Downer, okay? Um, as weird as this may sound, I kind of want to see those if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to share. Yeah, um, please. Someone has to play devil's advocate. I mean, really. To, yeah. that. to that point, I mean, this, this is exactly how the study that we were doing came about it was a tweet that I saw from uh, Steph. And um, it, Steph, you, you can describe, I think if, if you remember what it was. And I was, at first I was like, oh, it was my tweet? Okay, I remember being involved, but I remember um, the, the idea, I don't remember the tweet itself, but we were talking about uh, the voyeuristic nature of streaming 
Mm. Um, and just, I mean, if you look at this right now, like most of us, right, you can see our homes in our background. Presumably that's where people are, right? Um, family, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Right? <laughs> For those that are watching, you're exactly. seeing what's in front of me. You're not seeing what's behind me, which looks like a daycare. I got rid of I got rid of Hollywood Squares. It wasn't working too well for me. <laughs> but you know, so so you know, many of us are, are broadcasting from bedrooms, right? This is like our guest room that I've like fake made look like an office so I can teach from home, like things like that, right? Mm-hmm. But um, you know, a lot of streamers, right? They're they're broadcasting from their home. They're in a very vulnerable position just by the nature of of again. You know, maybe they're not posting their address, but they're revealing things about themselves to people who are watching them just based on like context, right? Mm. Um, you know, it's it's inevitable that you won't at least find out what state or general area someone's in, just like through casual conversation happening on their streams, right? Or things like their age or or in some cases relationship status, and that can get wild, right? So um yeah, I think it, it came about in thinking about the the nature of being vulnerable as sort of a um, almost a, a requirement right for streaming in a lot of cases and then of course how that uniquely uh, affects you know women streamers right or, or streamers of color um, who you know based on again having to be on camera lends itself to certain kinds of harassment and toxic behavior you know we could even go into you know really talking about unhealthy parasocial relationships mm-hmm. things like stalking right um, so mm-hmm. that was kind of that was actually how we kind of got started talking about this project. Yeah, the ways yeah. that I've seen it, um, merely in the research that I've done, and the, the things that I've read, is the, the unhealthy part is where there comes this form of idolization mm-hmm. of the person. So you're no longer looking at them as a friend, because a lot of people will build these parasocial relationships with people or characters where they have certain attributes that they either want to mimic or have themselves. And the more they get engrossed, the more they put these people on pedestals. Mm -hmm. They start to idolize them, which can lead to stalking and unhealthy behaviors. I'm I'm thinking of the example of Corpse Husband. Okay, so you guys heard of Corpse Husband? Oh yeah, love Corpse Husband. Yeah, I love him, right? But he doesn't show his face at all. We, nobody knows what he looks like. One of you could be a corpse husband for all I know, right? Sure. Um, um, okay, but, I, I have another streamer you know. that does the same thing. <laughs> He's hidden, yeah. You know, so, but there are, are, so he was a relatively small streamer until Among Us kind of blew him up, right? And now a lot of people know who he is. He has mentioned on Twitter, you know, that he's got like anxiety stuff that that is very scary for him as well. And he's like, I don't want to show my face, but Mm -hmm. people have demands on him. Like, oh, do a face reveal, do a face reveal, do a face reveal. He's like, I don't want to. Uh, yeah. But there's because people almost... want to have this connection, mm. right? Yes, and or I even think in it's... you know the the Twitch meetups or the, the you know the con meetups. Yeah, and I think it it's not it's coming from a place where I want to be close to this person, but it is not a healthy attachment in that case, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you because know, it's or... so skewed. Mm-hmm. When we have these relationships with people, it, it tends to be on this equal playing field Mm -hmm. you meet someone you hang out you exchange you get to know each other and and build this understanding on this level playing field but now it's so skewed where people want like that person to reveal their face they know a lot about him he knows none about them Mm. right Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, I've I've actually recently seen a a, a a female streamer that I that I follow. Um, one of her mods got an unhealthy attachment because of their mod status that they they felt they were trusted, so therefore they were entitled. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I and mean... I, I I do think sometimes you, you see, and I'm not by any means saying that this is the majority of people. I think most people's parasocial relationships are perfectly healthy. Um, but it, it certainly can go too far when there there is this perception that you are owed more than you are getting or, um, you know, sometimes I'll see things like, you know, we are, we support you, so you need to do this. Um, 
you know, a lot of, kind of streamers, a quit pro crow type of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of streamers have mentioned, like I mentioned before, people showing up to their houses, um, which is never OK. Right. You don't do that. Um, yeah. But it's because you're like, oh, you know, I'm your, you know, we're friends. I see you on here and like blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's, I, I mean, I can't count the number of people who stream or on YouTube or whatever who have like, don't show up to my house. Yeah. Um, so there certainly Dobrik can was, be. David Dobrik was a large one of that too. Very mm -hmm. popular YouTuber. Um, he made several, several YouTube videos basically saying, do not show up to my house. Yeah. And he um, and he created videos that would instill like that that parasocial relationship. He created these very fun, outlandish, crazy videos of him and his friends like doing stupid things. And he would get like these very uh, the word crazed is coming to mind, but that's not that great of a term, but these these very <laughs> loyal fans who desperately wanted to meet him <laughs> and yeah he made several several videos mm -hmm. and that is scary in a sense because yeah, mm -hmm. these people have built such an attachment where they've kind of skewed their own self-identity compared to the this other person how much this person means to them how much they idolize and put this person on a pedestal where they may not need to be there there are they want to and are regular people but they're also are entitled to their own uh, their own privacy to to switch it into the the other aspect the way i studied parasocial relationships was with fictional characters the the relationship you can build with this fictional character so you can't really stalk a fictional character or go to their house but yeah. you can build unhealthy attachments when you yourself don't feel too great about yourself and you idolize a specific character and believe that you need to be like them rather than being yourself i think there's something else to to present with this because uh, I actually wrote a book chapter al along the lines of her social relationships and distinguishing character from actor. Uh, and not to labor over the show Game of Thrones, but I always felt bad for Jack Gleason because he played his part of Joffrey so well that people oh gosh, couldn't yeah. stand him. And hated the, him. yeah, they hated him. And the poor guy. Uh, I mean, what was it? Maisie Williams was at a Tampa Bay Comic Con. I actually wrote this in this book, in my book that said, "Stop hating on this guy. He's really nice. Hate Joffrey, but not Jack." Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that was so important to where again, uh, Matt, to your to your original point about the idea of negative negativity. Oh yeah, it's it's there, um, and it it not only can work in the capacity of real people, but fictional as well. Um, yeah, uh, it, it goes along a lot of lines with expectancy violation. Uh, I, would, I almost would hate to play a really good character uh, because I know Captain, uh, what was this, uh, William Shatner. Um, people are like, he's a jerk in real life. Um, and, and I was like, that may be yeah. because you're putting him on this pedestal of you know Captain Kirk that you have to feel that way about him. Because yeah. you build this relationship with Captain Kirk. Yeah. Yes, but the the actor playing him is not Captain Kirk. He does not the, know the what way. speed the sliding doors you know move at and you know, <laughs> thrusters. You know he doesn't have those answers. No, I mean because that's, that's it, one of the things living in living in Los Angeles like I do. I I, I come in contact with a lot of celebrities just in passing because they live here, and some people, people are very surprised. Yeah, they're people too, and some people are very surprised that the person they meet on, you know, at the Rite Aid or the, you know, Starbucks is not the person that they uh, are watching yeah. on their shows. Because you build this relationship with this character, and one of them that I, well, that, that is in the the news right now, without going too spoiler into it, Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I think we're out of the. Or I think we're safely out of the range. We're, we're of safe. Spoiler. It's been out there for like a month. Wait, long. wait, wait! Y'all criticize me about Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about Mark. I'm just. Kidding. Well, <laughs> so that, that completely oh. got spoiled for me thanks to Twitter. So. Thanks, yeah, I, I stayed off of Twitter's. Just <laughs> got spoiled for my wife too. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately, Doctor were... Daniel, that's the privilege of being the host of the show, right? <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> Fair. But nice. people have built this relationship with Luke Skywalker, not not with Mark Hamill, but Luke Skywalker mm -hmm. for the past 50 years. Yeah, but I think Ish. even Mark Hamill has built a relationship with Luke Skywalker. Yeah, because he's That's played true. him for so, so long. He's embraced the character. Yeah, very much so. But, but I think when, yeah, uh, just to finish on a yeah, point, yeah, yeah. Matt, one thing that caught me out of off guard is when I finally realized who played the voice of Joker in Batman the Animated Series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was Luke Skywalker. It was Mark Hamill. And it yeah. floored me as a kid. Yes, me too. He also How plays Luke... Fire Lord Ozai. Yeah. Yes, he does. Oh, exactly. He's done a lot of voiceover work, actually. Oh, yeah. Right. He's amazing. Yeah. 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 But you. It... Uh, to to bring it back to almost like that that authenticity you know again and i'm going to bring it to even more real characters you talk about regis philbin mm -hmm. uh, being from new york i have to you know bring up new york new yorkers um my uncle brought uh was doing a job for regis philbin and he came he came to us the next day and was like he's a jerk but we've watched <laughs> right. him but we watched him do a daytime talk show where he's the nicest and funniest guy, does a great interview. And again, it goes back to that pedestal. But then mm -hmm. you talk about authenticity. My father worked for Con Ed and Rodney Dangerfield, <laughs> RIP, unfortunately. My father was working on his building. And Rodney Dangerfield in Rodney Dangerfield fashion came out in a robe and slippers and literally said to my father, hey, Con Ed, why are the lights out? And it, it, it was my father couldn't differentiate between Rodney Dangerfield in movies versus <laughs> the one that's in front of him right now. <laughs> Rodney like, Dangerfield was a my comedian. My lights are out. Right? I don't want to get no respect. He was a comedian, too. Yeah. He was yeah, a yeah. carpenter, too. He was yes. also a carpenter. Hey, Con Ed, why are the lights out? No How's respect. it going to be fixed? Back up, seriously. <laughs> There are some there are some actors that are kind of like that where you notice they kind of play the same kind of character all the time. Like mm -hmm. uh, they don't they don't really cast? change. Kevin Car Kevin Costner, Nicolas Cage. Um, Kevin Costner never does a sequel. <laughs> I mean, I, you I, also I, have. I know this is going to go over like a lead balloon, but Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion. Ooh, too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're not yeah. wrong. You're not wrong. Right. Yeah. Uh, Michael Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. We can do this game all day. Our, our, <laughs> I, I like Michael Sarah. He's just played the same role. Love Michael Sarah. Well, no. Okay. <laughs> like Eisenberg. <laughs> Steph and I have a friend who is in love with Keanu Reeves, but yeah, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Um, yeah, Keanu Reeves. Uh, which oh, I love John Wick, man. I love John Wick. It's my favorite. But... It's literally gonna yeah. make like twenty John Wick. So. <laughs> That's yeah, okay with me. He's gonna be the yeah. next James you know? Bond. I mean, I still see Keanu oh, Reeves yeah. as, uh, as Bill. So. That's, that's, yeah, me too. That was like the one departure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how I still see him. Yeah, but I mean, you you see the person with that link that you make with them wherever you see them, because you have this association with the character because you see something in them that you like or you want to imitate. Yeah, well, there's, I, yeah. there's a lot of identification that's involved. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ariane. Um, let's. I, I also want to mention that it's possible to have a, par a negative parasocial relationship. Well, I can't speak. Negative parasocial relationship. So if we go back to the example with Jack Leeson, for example, mm. um, where everybody like hates this kid, um, it, you have a relationship with Joffrey in Game of Thrones. You hate him, right? But that is still a relationship. It's just a negative one. Um, right. Right. No, 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 that, that's you okay. To try no, no, to no, 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 I'm not trying to contradict you. I was trying to... Woo! Believe, believe me, this 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 point has been hammered through. I, I actually really like this idea um, to, to go along with Ramsey Bolton's character, that he did some things that were extremely Ooh. uncomfortable Ooh. with a lot of viewers, Ooh. myself included, yeah. uh, to where I'm like, I don't know if I want to keep watching this show. I'm that uncomfortable. But there is kind of... 
I, I would argue it's kind of either uh, with the brand or kind of a cognitive dissonance to where mm -hmm. I would say I have to stick with it because you know, hypothetically a negative parasocial relationship would have an easy exit strategy. I just stop watching. Right. Right. But anyway, Ariane, I'm so sorry. No, I was just kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, what here is the challenge of it. The challenge is like it's so difficult to study negative parasocial relationships. Um, mm. It just gets twisted up in dislike, which is not quite the same. But it's like if you have like an arch nemesis, um, like there's this person in your life that you're like, this person wants to see me fail and I don't like them. They don't like me. Um, you still have a connection with them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, sure. It might not be a positive one. You might not enjoy spending time with them, but ultimately you still have a connection with them. And and when we when we talk about fiction, or even you know narrative structure in general, there's got to be conflict. And so as a result, you've got to have some. Per it's not necessarily a person. Like you watch Gravity, there's two people in it, right? Mm. Um, but oftentimes there's some villainous or antagonistic character that you you don't want them to succeed necessarily or win but you want them to be there like if we go back to the batman animated series you know life's more fun when the joker's there well, and, and some people get very attached to a lot of the villains because they see things in the villains that they may be feeling themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I think there needs yeah. to be an important distinction, though, of I love, I, you know, I like the Joker because, you know, as chaotic evil as he is, he makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases. So, you know, it, and he's a lot more interesting than boring old Batman. Um, <laughs> no. But I will say one, one thing with negative parasocial is the idea of I, I genuinely stay in a relationship on the but I can't stand this person. This is actually a study a colleague and I are doing. Um, we content analyzed um, the Facebook group Occupy Democrats. And the majority of the posts that came from our sample were about Donald Trump. So, you know, this was the kind of thing. Now, a lot of it was, I'm scared for my life. Of what the hell is this person going to say? Um, but, but a lot of it is, you know, we're posting about this person versus posting somebody that's in our party. Um, so, you know, it, it does really get into this. I can't stand this person. However, I'm going to keep posting about them. And, you know, in, in a way they're still kind of living lit, rent free in your brain. Right. Right. And a lot of people have that, that ability to kind of stick with you, whether they are good or bad. And even more so now with social media, because we get inundated and flooded with so much information that we can't kind of turn it off. There, there's always something there. To contrast that as well, uh, the one of the reasons why I, I studied fictional characters is because oftentimes, certainly within games, it's a lot of a more active medium compared to a passive medium which is reading or watching a show where you're actually controlling the character so you can kind of build two different types of parasocial relationships the ones where you're in you're playing an on rails story versus a game like mass effect which is kind of the 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 one i fall back to where you're making your shepherd what is my shepherd going to do? How is my shepherd going to behave? We actually right. totally have another study about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. You have to send me all of those studies. That, that's that came up quite a bit in that one, yeah. Yeah, well, it was about moral decision-making specifically, but... Um, yeah. yeah, a lot there, of the decision-making games, like the, the Dragon Ages... Yeah, um, came up. That's Steph's favorite. Yeah. Uh, I, when you were Thank talking you, about Pale. before you get Nothing to Mass Effect, that's the Bioware all the way. Anytime, like, I yeah. get well, so... Bioware before yeah, Anthem? This year's PAX East. <laughs> yes, yes. We don't talk <laughs> I don't about even, Anthem. Yeah, I don't even think of Anthem as like part of part of that. Um, yeah, Anthem, no, Dragon Age is like my favorite. But I get I get so yeah, I invested in those parasocial relationships with you know, games like that, right? Where it's, it's also like your character that you can create and, and role Skyrim. play yourself. But yeah. Mm -hmm. But even because even I mean, in the NPCs, you're you're building these 
relationships because you're right. interacting right. with these characters. You're making decisions, having these conversations that you're building this relationship with someone that is not real. Mm -hmm. You know, Steph, it's I mean, oh, go ahead, Ariane, oh, sorry. Um, I had a conversation one time, this was a few years back with a guy named Rick Bissell who wrote um, the, the model of narrative engagement. And he insisted that it is not possible to form a parasocial relationship with a video game character because you are controlling them. So it's not parasocial, it is identification. So it's, you are inhabiting that character. Mm. I push back on that though, um, because mm. I, I think that might be the case if we're talking about these games where you're uh, kind of self-inserting, um, which came up a lot in our in our paper that we I just mentioned. Um, but you know, I, like this past, um, summer i played the last of us 2 um mm. which features two protagonists that are antagonists to each other right um Ooh. and i don't know that i could say that i'm just inhabiting them right i think that there's a relationship aspect to that um, cuz you're not making the same type of choices in like an rpg like dragon age or mass effect where you're having these decision wheels mm -hmm. versus a, a Last of Us, which is a story on rails. Yeah, right. I mean, and, and so, you know, there's a sort of a range, right? There's some games that have sort of semi choice based structure. Um, there's some that are the characters just sort of a blank slate that you're creating like a Skyrim Dova mm -hmm. kind of guy or girl or Khajiit or whatever. Um, and, and kind of in, everywhere in between. Um, so, I mean, I am of the opinion that it's totally possible to have a parasocial relationship with an avatar, um, but certainly it does seem like it is more likely whenever the character has some kind of established separation from you, the person. Right. I mean, yeah, look, I I'm, I'm, a, I'm a JRPG fan, thus my like little persona block. I was just going to say. Um, um, but I mean, one of my friends are big fans of the Persona series. Yeah, <laughs> and, and from Persona Three, one of the I, big things was the relationship aspect. And Steph and I have gone on uh, some decent conversations about Fire Emblem Three Houses, and mm -hmm. we're like, "Who are we going to date?" You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm st I'm still waiting game. to see what Joe's relationship is going to be with with Tom Milk, So. <laughs> That's true. There's a character with with some negative parasocial history. Yeah, you, you had to slide it in there, Nate, didn't you? That was good, Nate. <laughs> so, so for just, for our friends here, um, since <laughs> February, so getting edited out. It is, and that's okay. But <laughs> since February, um, we have been attempting to put Animal Crossing in every single episode of the podcast. Some, some sometimes forcibly shoehorning it in. Yeah, sometimes it's shoehorned. <laughs> sometimes it's the it's the great like Nate. That was great. That was great. Yeah, Nate just slides Slid it in. It in there. Yeah, and um, the reason we do this is because Joe hates it. <laughs> <laughs> and now he actually has to play the game. Yes, because of the incentive for our charity stream. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe now has to play. I'm the getting game. a message right now. I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, he's got to play the game with me. <laughs> so, um, so we apologize. Ready when you are, friend. Ready when you are. <laughs> I am also not into Animal Crossing, so I'm like the only one. I um a, a student of mine had an Animal Crossing graduation, and they had to like hook it up on Zoom so that I could see. That was cool. Because I oh was, wow, that's interesting. I, yeah, it was actually really cool. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have Animal Crossing, so I was just like watching the like capture card. But, yeah, um, yeah. Animal Crossing is interesting because sort of there is no story, really. Yeah, no. Right. So people sort of establish their own, which is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, we we actually have lots of 
in, in that special issue that I mentioned, people mentioned people, there's a few papers that people submitted that are about Animal Crossing. Um, because, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the game also came out at- Perfect the, time. Perfect yeah, time. perfect yeah. time for them, worst time for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but it came out in a time where nobody had control over life. Yeah. In a sense, yes. not again, not to get dark and dreary, but it, but the game, in a sense, made people have somewhat of control. They were able yeah. to control how their house looks, how their you know garden in the front looks, sorry, how much, Chad. how many turnips they're going muted. to sell. I went to go get some um, Swedish fish. things like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm extending this for Joe. <laughs> um. <laughs> The, the thing about any time that there was a Smash character announcement, like when Isabel was announced that she was going to be on Smash, I'm like, Animal Crossing people erupted. I mean, the same way when, when Joker came on the scene with uh, Smash Brothers, I I, yeah. I was like, well, I'm, I'm buying the fighter pack. That's, Which uh, is so perplexing to me. Like, just, it doesn't <laughs> mesh with my idea of Smash Bros to have the, well, when I played him, uh, his name was Stinky Butt Face. <laughs> That's not uh, a real character. Oh, that's it's right. Like, that's no, no, no. That's that just an art. Yeah. No, right. well, so you can name him. So I named him Stinky Buttface. And so every time somebody talked to him, they were like, "Hey, Stinky, what you doing?" Blah 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 blah. Stinky Coon. <laughs> so the Stinky Chan, Stinky so, Senpai. <laughs> but I think also too, Smash is interesting, and I'm I'm gonna try to correlate this with parasocial relationships because again. <laughs> I mean, everybody is sort of demanding for their character, their their who they want in Smash in the word in, in in either a healthy or if you go on Twitter, an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, so Byleth. everybody was, yeah. Oh God, when when Byleth came out, everybody was pissed except for me because I'm like, yeah. great, I, like, I love Byleth. Right. Byleth. Yeah, Byleth's and great. Let's I'm still go. waiting for them to add Goku. <laughs> oh my God! But and and. and it, that's a joke, but that's a very real thing. People are demanding that Nintendo and Sakurai work with um, <laughs> work with the creators of DBZ to get Goku in because that's their character. That's who they they want their worlds to mesh. So for somebody who is a ginormous fan of Smash, they want their character who they love. Yeah, because be they want to mesh it a little love. bit with uh, Shonen Jump. Right. Because Shonen right. Jump did like that anime esque Smash Bros. It, yeah, the Jump Force. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. or or they just want to do like their own uh, fan fiction battle between Sonic and Goku and see who wins the Super Saiyan battle. That's it too. Absolutely. <laughs> Goku would win. <laughs> but we'll and see. here it begins. I'm just yeah. <laughs> where it say, with the Goku figures there and a Sonic figure up here somewhere. <laughs> I see it. I see its head peeking out in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> in, in between Sam is a Mega Man. Yeah. yeah. But would Goku beat Superman? Oh no. Oh no. No, no. no. Next taking topic. that deep Next dive? topic. Bye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Run away. But yeah, this no, is I'm where these kidding. parasocial relationships really come in, where yes. people mm -hmm. are so invested with these characters because they know them in and out, but they've never met them. And mm -hmm. they will defend them fiercely because they've built this attachment to them. Not that they hate the other characters, just yeah. mine is better. Yeah. So it creates this in group, out group aspect. What? Yeah, no, you're totally right. I mean, um, you know, we're we're laughing and joking, but you're absolutely right that that's ultimately an extension of parasocial relationships, right? You know, I I don't like. I have an example of when my nephews were younger. I have two nephews. They are now nine and five, but at, at the time of the story, they were like three and seven, and um, they were staying at my mom's house, and I was there for Christmas and stuff, and we went to the local library and got a book that was a race between the Flash and Superman, okay? Now in the book, as in canon, Barry Allen is faster than Superman. Most of the As time. it should be. As, I mean, that's his only power. I mean, he should be, right? But- Well, that could be debated. There are quite a few more other powers for the Flash, but I'll they are digress all related into that. To, <laughs> to speed, speed and yeah, speed force. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But my youngest nephew, who was, again, three at the time, at the end of the book, you know, I read the end of it. And he was like, no, Flash didn't win. Superman won. I was like, but he actually didn't. Like, if you see here, like, that's the Flash. He's in front. Superman's behind him. The Flash has won. And he's like, no. And he cried. Uh, he cried because Poor guy. <laughs> the Flash beat Superman in the book. And he would not stop crying until we said, okay, fine, Superman won. But it's, I mean, that, that's a funny example. And I'm absolutely, you know, when he gets older and like starts dating and stuff, I'm going to tell everyone he brings home. You're going to bring that up at their wedding. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But that's a wedding. It's a, it's a story forever. Um, yeah, but but it, it brings up this this aspect where we tend to, to defend what we care about so fiercely. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, like I was saying to Nate the other day, I can or today I congratulated Team USA for winning the World Juniors. I love my American friends, but during World Juniors, Canada Canada always is the best hockey team. <laughs> but we see this like in the Olympics and stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, um, you, the U.S. Uh, is, yeah. I mean, obviously pretty nationalistic in terms of national pride. Mm -hmm. I see, like, mm -hmm. this, you know, people got American flags and things like that, and other countries don't do that. Except the Olympics, right? Yeah, the Olympics, um, yeah. and our country is the Olympics, best. Oh. Absolutely. Or the World Cup is probably even a better example. Oh, yeah. Um, where like mm -hmm. people get killed if they fail their country, right? Um, I, I will say I had some conflict um, during, I think it was the 2010 um, Olympics, where US was actually playing really well in hockey. Uh, and I grew up being a diehard Penguins fan. And so when Sidney Crosby scored the goal on Ryan Miller to win the gold medal <laughs> for Canada, I was like labeled as a traitor for you know, American fans everywhere because they're like, I bet you're thrilled. And I'm like, no, actually, I'm, I'm rooting for the United States in this game. I, I, you know, I like Sidney wow. Crosby because I'm a Penguins fan. But that's, no. that's how I felt about yeah. Canada with Drew Doughty. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it, you know, sports is also a great example of this. Like, Emory and I have a standing bet every year uh, that started last year, which was a great year for it. This year, not so much. Um, where I'm a big LSU college football fan. He's a big Alabama fan. So we have a bet that whoever whoever's team wins the game that year, the other person gets a free Funko Pop. Um, <laughs> this one and, right here. Yeah, yeah. He, he <laughs> one got punch it. man yeah. tornado, yeah. Yeah, mine's in my office at work. But um, – I got Todoroki, um, but <laughs> I like I could be like, man, Joe Burrow, like that's my guy, right? Like I, you know, we're best buds because we went to the same <laughs> school, you know. Um, but, but you, you have this right attachment here. just because of the school. Yeah, I've never met him, and yeah. if I tried to like talk to him, he'd be like, "Who the hell are you?" You know. <laughs> um, he seems like a perfectly lovely guy, but maybe he's a total dickhole. I don't know, right? <laughs> um, I've never met him, but I feel like this strong attachment to him. I hope he's not. That would be really sad. <laughs> but it's, it goes but back he to could like, be. yeah, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about before, right? Right. Um, and when where, people say like, "Oh, this is," uh, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'll make fun of myself. Like, the Jets are my team, and it's like, oh. well, wait a minute. Do you? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've resigned that I'll never Gates see is gone. He, Gates is gone. He can't hurt you anymore. Yeah. yeah. Look, man, I, I've recently matter. had to, I've recently had to become a Bengals fan, so I understand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was gonna say Nate Nate'll get happy about that one. Bills. But like but that's, that's also saying but that's saying like oh, wait a minute, I I'm not a running back. I don't play I don't I'm not a wide receiver for that team. Like um it's but it's that connection. Yeah, people build this relationship with a team, yeah. a, a player, or the idea of. Right, yeah. Parallel, well, parasocial relationships are everywhere. People just don't acknowledge them. part of your identity, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and th this is this connection between these concepts of parasocial relationships and identification, where identification with a character is similar, but there's essentially no distance between yourself and the character. So if you're playing as <laughs> Hude, I, I'm sure I have some Hude at stuff as well. I'm a Saints fan too. Um, but we have these relationships with these players that then help us to identify with the team, incorporate right. 
the team identity into my, ours. I am an LSU fan. I went to LSU. I went to every football game when I was in college because I was in the band and I was a kind of a nerd. But I went to every game and I love nothing LSU nerdy about that. <laughs> I mean, I played the trombone. What, what, you know? So did I. Uh, so did I. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I played Sorry. for four years in LSU's Tiger Band. It's a big part of my identity. So, like, even now, two schools later, I went to Penn State for my uh, master's and PhD. Could not care mm. less about Penn State sports. I asked stuff like when I was there, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, Penn State, whatever, blah, blah. I'd be like, yeah, well, well. yeah, you're in grad school. You don't have time for that. And now nice. that I teach at Florida State, you State, over, you would have you you been right to Rutgers. Rutgers got a good, <laughs> good college team. <laughs> Uh, well, now I'm at Florida State, and I also, I've go. been to a couple of games, and I also still don't care about their football team. So I'm sorry yeah. to any of my students watching this. Um, <laughs> last year, when LSU played in the national championship, I literally showed my. St- <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, I mean, it's these things are also hard to shake, right? Like it's hard to yeah. supplant sure. some sort of identity with another um, based on these relationships and. You know, I, I am cool with Florida State, you know. I like my job. I like my friends. I like everything. But I'm not like, yeah, Florida State. Right? But your heart is somewhere else. And I think it's too. I think it's too because that relationship you have with that parasocial relationship, that doesn't make sense. But it, it's it, meta. Yeah, it's meta. But it, it impacted your life significantly. So it, it's mm-hmm. going to hold a lot more weight than anything else realistically can can i bring up a really good example of this of um i i'm a bills fan by marriage Uh, my wife is from buffalo so um i will say when and to go back with the Bengals, i'm going to go into transition here when andy Dalton, no andy don't although i love fitzpatrick uh when andy dalton magic it's magic that's right (laughs) um the beard he he threw a touchdown pass that put buffalo in the playoffs and Buffalo was so thrilled, the city, that they donated, yep. I think it was like $250,000 <laughs> to Andy Dalton's charity. His which foundation in, in since, yeah. It's, it's, what a lovely story. And I mean, we've been talking yeah. a lot about like parasocial being so negative. And I'm like, right. this is a beautiful example. I mean, Josh Allen, his, his uh, grandmother died and the, the Bills donated a million dollars uh, towards the foundation that you know he, he dedicated for, and I'm like, that's beautiful. Um, oh, and, and there were like there were even a bunch of Cincinnati again you know, the Cincinnati fan base that donated to that. Yeah, because it, yeah. the the relationship that was that was born out of the Ryan Fitzpatrick thing, you know, Fitzpatrick's playing in Miami now. It's magic, right? God, it's God magic. magic. But that relationship that was forged over that playoff, right? That that playoff yeah. appearance, it, it still holds true, right? Sure. And, you know, this is similar w- with Joe Burrow. Whenever he won the Heisman Trophy last year, he mentioned growing up in Athens, Ohio, and how it was a very poor area. And mm-hmm. people from Louisiana donated in droves to mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. the Athens, Ohio food bank um, because of that connection. And I know so many people who are like, I'm trying to be a Bengals fan now. Um, we're not, I mean, <laughs> we're really a Joe Burrow fan. Um, or... I have, a yeah, lot of, yeah. I have a lot of I have a lot of Bengals fan, fans in California I mean, that look, were Carson Palmer y'all, fans. Y'all broke so. him, so I need y'all to not do that again. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, but we're gonna fight over that one. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he. Um, so that you know that happened because of that connection, and also now like there's this friendship between like the LSU fan base and Ohio State because Ohio State is where Joe Burrow went first, mm-hmm. and then he came to LSU. Um, so LSU fans are, you know, the national championship that's coming up. We're like, yeah, Ohio State. We're also we don't like Alabama, but um. because these parasocial relationships kind of yeah. transcend mm-hmm. where the person is. Yeah. And for me, I, I I started looking at the parasocial relationships because they often were seen as negative. Uh, mm-hmm. I think back to the, the negative ways people viewed video games back in the 90s. Oh, Mortal Kombat was going to rot your brain or kind of um, there was the, the Mortal Kombat or was Doom and there were countless others. And, Doom was going to uh, make you go on a rampage. Yeah. I, I always heard that. Yeah. And there was... I feel uh, called out here. 
<laughs> it makes me think of well, they, they kind of harken back to the Bandura Bobo doll study where you see someone wailing on a Bobo doll, you the kid will repeat the hitting on the Bobo doll. And for me, seeing that it, it made me think that may not always be the case because I have a different relationship with these characters. Yep. And it, it it's been a while. I, I back in undergrad, so this was back in two thousand. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Eight. Oh God, it's it's been a while. So two thousand eight, I watched a documentary from the History Channel called uh, "Comic Books Superheroes Unmasked." I don't know if anyone's seen that uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. And they Might really be. touched on Dr. Frederick Wortham, which is. A psychiatrist that did a study back in a whole bunch of ethics things in that and statistics <laughs> uh, kind of faux pas where he did a study on youths in juvenile detentions and their reading materials and he correlated that the people the youth that are in jail read comic books ergo comic books rot your brain and turn you to a juvenile delinquent which led to the creation of the Comics Code Authority. T to me, that's an asinine correlation. But I always looked at these characters, not if you look at like the book or the story that is going on, but at the foundation of these characters, what they can bring to you and help you be a better person. Because I studied parasocial relationships and pro-social behaviors, how those relationships help you be a better person right a lot of people have the the saying of oh what would jesus do all right well what would spider-man do in this right. case i i love that aspect of it and i it's and it is one of those things of the creation of why these things exist are for pro-social purposes the the whole purpose of anime was after the bombing uh, in in uh, the atomic bombs in World War II in Japan, you know they, they they yeah and and Nagasaki they put in uh, you know Astro Boy to give kids hope and mm -hmm. teach them resilience and friendship and I mean I, I love uh, shonens um, I mean I've got my hero back here I've got uh, Demon Slayer back here nice. and I I was told as a young kid about things about media relations but you know one thing was it was, like, it was the anime is going to rock your brain and this that and the other and i'm like i have been taught you know pushing past my limits that the people around me are extremely important and you know honing on those friendships really does uh you know help build me as a person uh and i can build them um, you know, by, by, you know, putting in that hard work. And I think there's so much to be said, not only because, I mean, again, I, a pair of social relationships are very uh, apparent in the anime world. Um, but it is something of that um, identification where I feel like I want to be like Midoriya. I want to be like Tanjiro or Naruto um, you know, well, <laughs> some, some, some things in Naruto, you know, um, <laughs> I, I <laughs> kind of a, kind of a dope, but he's, he's just, he's a lovely do dope and, uh, he, he just wants to be around his friends and try really, really hard. And I love that aspect of just trying hard and being resilient, uh, despite the fact that you can fail over and over and over again, but as long as you get up one more time and that, and that's great projection and identification with parasocial relationships and characters because there was a study well a couple studies uh in 2004 th well, three four and 13 so calvert richards and kent uh, gola richards uh lurisila and calvert and palmer they really much studied kids and their relationships with sesame street hmm. and how much they learned empathy and the importance of a diverse cultures, the grammar notions and mathematics better while learning through Sesame Street, learning through that intermediary than being taught in school. Because yeah. they had that link with that character. They were invested with that character. And I think, um, I, I think what this, another thing that this is highlighting is the importance of 
having parasocial relationships with diverse um, characters. Um, so I, I, I keep going back to my nephews because I don't know. I like them. Who knows? But um, <laughs> they are big superhero fans and they love Black Panther. <laughs> they love Miles Morales. In fact, my brother, my uh, sister and brother-in-law and uh, Santa um, got them a PlayStation 5, which I haven't even got one yet, but they got one. And they played Miles Morales in like two days, right? Um, and they connect so strongly with those characters. And it's almost like, look, um, I can be like Spider-Man. Right. I can be a hero. Maybe not literally, might not literally have, you know, they know they don't literally have superpowers, but I can be this good person or, you know, um, you know, a big theme of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse was like you, you get knocked, as Emery was saying, you know, you get the crap kicked out of you. Life might beat you up, but every time you get back up and because it goes through really that with those. hero's journey that Joseph Campbell really. Yeah. Put forward. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. a hero um, needs and, to fail so then they can pick themselves up and move forward, which really harkens right. to one thing and I work a lot with my clients is post-traumatic growth. I, I work a lot with trauma clients on post-traumatic growth. What happened to you can either keep pushing you down and mm -hmm. keep you down or let's use it to light a fire under your ass and move forward. Right. And and so I think it's really key that, especially when we think about children, actually a lot of the parasocial work is on children. Um, and, and part of that is because people are worried, like, oh, you don't think of the children, right? But what we see is that, I mean, kids connect with media characters. And if we say our brains can't tell the difference, theirs really can't. No, right? no. there's and, a whole bunch of studies on that as well. And, where and, you know, they don't know the difference between a fictional world and a, uh, an not. actual world prior. Oh, I'm trying to remember the exact age, but I think it's seven. Yeah, it's like the seven PA, to nine PSA, it, um, is when they start to, to develop the, the difference between the two. Yeah. And, you but, know, back, back to my nephews, we went to Disneyland one time and my, my nephew was talking to Anna and Elsa from Frozen. He doesn't understand it. He didn't at that mm -hmm. time that they were not real um but but for him it, they were there they went from absolutely. the screen to yeah mm -hmm. and if we think about that's sesame why disney street, world is there <laughs> exactly and if we think about sesame street back to that it is the same kind of thing because sesame street um i, I don't want to be quoting wrong history here so please someone correct me if this is not true this is just what i remember um that is it's kind of created to give kids who de didn't necessarily have great opportunities for education an opportunity to do that at home and they often were very much like, we are going to make sure that we are showing, we're not lying to kids. We're not gonna sugarcoat things. You know, they rather famously had the death of Mr. Hooper back in the mm -hmm. 70s, I think. Um, and they, they have, they make an effort to bring in diverse characters, even in the Muppets um, and in, in the, the human people. Um, Sesame Street because has Because it goes back to that sort of parasocial contact. Sesame Street has spawned yeah, there's so, versions of Sesame many, Street. so many versions of it. For my son's three, and for him right now, his main thing he is obsessed with Blippy on YouTube. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but Blippy yeah. is a character that, in, in a way, works the same way as Sesame Street did for me when, when I was sure. when I was growing up. He's teaching my son letters colors uh things floating or sinking mm -hmm. I, I, I we've worked with him a little bit on things but he's really picked it up there and he's watching it in english and we're french so we're bilingual right but he's becoming bilingual because he's watching english tv and he understands both at three mm -hmm. I, and, I, and you know right if now I can, if i can get my TV. If I can get my daughter to stop dumping the cat food in their water dish to find out if it floats or sinks, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, like my nephews right now, they're doing online school because of the pandemic. And ultimately that <laughs> becomes sort of parasocial. Um, 
not you know to the same degree it goes back to what mm. i'm talking about where essentially um they're doing online school and they have a teacher but i, I mean as a teacher i know it's not the same it doesn't mm-hmm. you don't get as much from the students they might you know not my wife's a middle school teacher i understand yeah i you could not pay me enough <laughs> you know you have to be paying me like three billion dollars to be a middle school teacher <laughs> um but yeah, like with you me, know my with... youngest nephew in particular uh he he doesn't mm-hmm. want to sit there and so like it's important that the, uh, the teacher has to try to engage him in but it is parasocial because she's, she's getting nothing from him he's not mm-hmm. you know Cause... he's not sharing anything with her well i mean on that note <laughs> but, with my wife being a middle, middle school teacher like I have this rig set up because I podcast, I stream, I do all the stuff. So she's the teacher that streams, mm-hmm. right? And she has a setup. She's well above and far and beyond. And so she is now the- um, More than just uh, their laptop webcam and right. crappy earbuds. <laughs> yeah. And she also runs the, uh, the, the, the school's gaming club. So she's in charge of their Discord, which oh, let me tell you, that's, that's, a, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Because for me, with therapy, having the teletherapy is harder than I'll, I would have thought at first, and even more so now. Because, yeah, I'm still doing the same thing, but this is there's this artificial barrier. Uh, like I was saying to my students, uh, to my um, my clients, and a lot of people not being able to hand a tissue if someone's Mm -hmm. having an emotional reaction to something. I took it for granted because I practiced for years prior to that. I said, oh, they're crying. Oh, a show of empathy and hand the tissue. It builds this this connection. And now it's, did you have tissue near you? You could grab it. Yeah, I teach statistics and I it is so difficult because it is it is ultimately really one-sided in a way that I never would have expected, but not being able to see on their face if they are confused or not being able to see on their screen when we're using the software, if they're doing the correct thing. Um, so if they're teaching to st- st- statistics, generally they are confused. Get- <laughs> yeah, no, you're not yes. wrong. <laughs> and they probably need a tissue. That, yeah. yeah, I'm in the class. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it kind of looks like. Um, yeah. Actually, mostly it's just names. Uh, I don't see a lot of faces. Um, but it, it, I mean, it, it kind of comes full circle, right? Because a, a lot of communication theories, they go through these cycles where it falls out of favor for a while, then it comes back. You know, two-step flow was one that opinion leaders kind of fell out of fashion when everybody had access to TV. But now that there's so much information, now we need opinion leaders again. Um, and I think parasocial relationships, we kind of saw something similar. Um, there was some work originally in the 50s. Then we didn't really see too much until about the 80s and 90s. Um, and then in the 2000s is when we started to get more once we um, had more social media and a more um, more options for entertainment, frankly. Um, and and I think it, it does become relevant in situations like this because it's as... I've changed my thinking in recent years about parasocial versus social being more of a continuum than a dichotomy. Um, whereas there's kind of a sliding scale of parasociability or parasociality. Um, you know, if you're watching me teach on Zoom, certainly there's social interaction, but not right. as much as if we were in person. Um, and you know but yet more than if you know i was a streamer you know what i mean so that's that's the thing is trying to figure out where that that transaction is so one thing Mm -hmm. i I studied in my thesis and and what i do with clients as, as well is think about our wealth of knowledge that we have and how much of that knowledge that we have gained comes from people we have never met Mm-hmm. We have never interacted with anything that is where it be religious. You read the Bible or the Quran or that holy text. You're reading something that someone else wrote. So you're building a relationship with that. 
or uh, you think about the Greeks, the relationship they has with they had with their gods because people told them these stories. The things that we know now, how Newton discovered gravity, well, quote unquote, discovered. We never met Newton. We never had a conversation with him, but we know it. We, we've learned about it. So these are all these parasocial relationships. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting Matt, way to think about that. Yeah, yeah Matt, right. we can't hear you. That's oh, good. Matt. Sorry. Um, it's, yeah, I had it on my microphone instead. It is You're amazing how how large. <laughs> of a conversation we have had about this one topic. You yeah. know, we're going on like a, a two hour mark here. Um, it just, and I think that shows the strength and just the complexity yeah. of, of breath Paris of this. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it started in the 50s, died down and started back up in the early, mid 2000s, early 2000s. Sure. And we are in Ish. such a technological era now that we can do things so virtually. Right. And, build and is that is, yeah. is that, is that an is that an adequate replacement for actual physical relationships now? So I think that's a I'll be honest with you, that's a mm-hmm. larger conversation. And we could probably sit here. Uh, we Another would if hours. I didn't say anything. We, we will can. sit here. Uh, until two o'clock in the morning, but um, I do think we need to start sort of, kind of wrapping this up. And I'd rather um, give Joe grief about Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> you already did. Um, <laughs> I'll edit that one out. <laughs> I do. Uh, so I do want to thank everybody here today for coming, yes. and sharing your knowledge with us, and just making this an awesome awesome yeah. conversation have all of you back and continue discussing this yeah because oh, you know what i'm having too much fun anytime i thoroughly to join a uh an after con bar conversation <laughs> let me it's tell you something man. about parasocial oh, man. relationships <laughs> <laughs> give me three glasses of scotch and we're good <laughs> but again it, it, it is amazing how we can intertwine all of these very scientific and very legitimate ideologies built Mm -hmm. within psychology Mm -hmm. and relate it to things that we love we we spoke Mm -hmm. all about pop culture video games anime uh, comic book characters and made it this i had a lot of fun this conversation Mm -hmm. so i'm gonna i'm gonna be beaming for a little bit um so but I do want to give our guests here an opportunity if they want to plug anything in particular before I go into my long rant. Yeah, shut yourselves out. By all means. <laughs> I don't have anything to plug. Okay. <laughs> Could you... Um, where, where can they find you? Mm. Yeah, where can they find Socials. you? Yeah, uh, I can be found on Twitter at Fasho A. That's F-E-R-C-H-A-U-D-A. Um, where I mostly tweet about random memes... LSU football and uh, the occasional gift. Yeah. And and soon to be Joe Burrow. <laughs> yeah. No, I do also tweet about Joe Burrow. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Cool. Um, yes, please. Oh, all right. Um, so, yeah, I can be found at, uh, at Stephanie Orm. That's S T E P H A N I E O R M E. Uh, as far as plugging things go, I will say that uh, I have recently launched a, an initiative um, that I'm calling Free Play, and the idea is it's about uh, encouraging marginalized genders to participate in esports, uh, which can be a really intimidating scene for people who feel overwhelmed by steep learning curves that a lot of esports games have. Um, and so, basically, what we are doing in our first our first video series is launching later uh, this month. Um, 
but it's going to be a series of intro videos teaching people how to play League of Legends. That's the first game we're starting with. And uh, it'll be a series of YouTube videos, but also live streams where people can hop and chat, ask questions, and literally be kind of walked through in phases um, different parts of learning how to play a game that honestly is quite overwhelming for people who are, who are just starting out. So again, the idea there is to kind of reduce that barrier to access for people who would often yeah. be too afraid to dive into a game that I play all the time and I'm still terrified. So um, <laughs> yeah, so I'll, you can you can find uh, a link to info about that on my, my Twitter and stuff. That's Fantastic. awesome. If, if you ever do Overwatch, please remember me. <laughs> because I love Overwatch and I play it so much. Anyway, um, no, that, that he got that you well then. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, I would join that you on sounds that really one, cool. <laughs> um, and Doc, please, Doctor Daniel. Yeah, for me, um, I can be found on Twitter as well. It's at Fusro Doc, uh, F U S R O D O C, um, and I've got two minor things I want to plug. Uh, one is through Geek Therapeutics uh, for the online training. Uh, but not only that is the Clinician's Guide to Geek Therapy, um, which is a, a great book that uh, you know, some of us are featured in in, in, in this present conversation. Um, so, but a great resource. Uh, there it is, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, the other thing I want to plug real quick is I'm also the marketing director for Geeks Like Us. Um, please make sure to follow uh, our Twitter and join our Discord. I stream on every Tuesday. I'm actually doing, uh, I, I do a lore stream and I'm doing Persona 5. Um, oh, I've, done, no. I've done Skyrim and Blood. Uh, that now, now it's, uh, now, now the weaves are taking over uh, for Persona 5. And it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. I'll, I'll sign on when you get to uh, Animal Crossing lore. <laughs> I actually totally forgot that I wrote a book. <laughs> plug it away. Yeah, plug it away. Like that. yeah. yeah, that's, um, that's huge. Book, please. <laughs> yeah, I wrote um, a book all about binge watching, um, including sort of some cultural aspects of the TV industry and how it has progressed, as well as some social science approaches to processing binge narratives. Uh, the book is called Binge and Bingeability. The antecedents mm. and consequences consequences of binge watching behavior. It's based on my dissertation, but uh, it's actually entirely different from my dissertation. Maybe I should have called it something else. But um, <laughs> I, I like the Jane Austen reference. It's out. I yeah. thank you, thank you. I was hoping that people would get it, um, but I, it, it's a, it was definitely a labor of love. And if you like binge watching, or if you don't like binge watching, you want to see what it's all about. Um, yeah, check it out. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Guardians Mental Health Podcast. Uh, if you can, please leave us a review on iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you listen to your podcast. It does help spread the podcast to others. It works positive in the algorithm. And we'll read your reviews live. Uh, keep up to date with everything we're doing over at guardiansmh.org. And follow us on Twitter at guardiansmh. Um, feel free to join our partner Discord server at discord.gg slash guardiansmh, where we provide peer support, mental health resources, and just a really chill community. If you are able to, please feel free to donate to uh, the nonprofit uh, at tiltify.com at guardiansmh. Uh, if you want to assist us in keeping our mental health kit initiative alive and spreading these kits out to everyone you can donate either at our Patreon at patreon.com slash guardians uh, GMH mental health kits or our Ko-Fi at Ko-Fi.com slash guardians MH coffee. Also it's coffee. I say Ko-Fi. I know. Um, also it's coffee. Um, <laughs> if you guys, <laughs> if Jeff all over again, I mean a coffee. Yeah. If you guys want some awesome <laughs> merch, very comfortable shirts that have our beautiful logo on it. Yep, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, feel free to check out uh, bonfire.com slash store slash guardians MH. Um, all proceeds from the merch goes right back into the nonprofit, which keeps this organization running, keeping us spreading very positive resources and keeps, keeps Joe's heater here. on. Keeps Joe's heater on. Mm -hmm. Not at all, though. It's actually. not true. That's on my own electric, just so you know. <laughs> And that's that's the end of that's the end of our plugs. 
Oh, also, no, I'm sorry. Um, please also check on, out. No. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Daniel said it before, but also check out geektherapeutics.com, the mental health streamer kit. Almost everybody, everybody in this chat here um, had a handle in that in the streamer mental health kit. Please go check that yes. out as well, too. Yes, it's a fantastic program. Uh, you will enjoy it immensely. And uh, I was going to actually plug that if you didn't get a chance to. And <laughs> yes, I, I cannot praise that program enough. And definitely go check that out. Okay. But on that note, thank you yeah. so much for joining us tonight. It was a, a great conversation. Yes, thank you all. so much for thank having you. us. Yeah, thank you. All right. Alrighty. So, all right. Bye bye, everyone. I've... Stop streaming. Who we raiding? Who we raiding? Stop stream. Stop stream. <laughs> thank you for having fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it was a great talk. I, oh, I think man. we would have gone for like another two hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Believe me, I felt so bad. Good. I felt bad cutting it off. I just, I was, I looked at the time and I was like, oh no.